So good morning everyone, my name is Ayo. I just want to make sure that people at the back can hear me. So people at the back, can you hear me? Okay, is that okay? So great. So I don't need to use the microphone because I just feel like using the microphone is just like singing some song or something. So probably not. I don't want to have like karaoke or something. So my background is from engineering as Harry has mentioned and I have learned a lot, a lot from Harry because she is a very expertise in the clinical section. So I, my background is engineering. So today what I want to talk about is whether telehealth, um, telehealth is promised but it's not a pet savior. So it means that it's not everything. It's, it's a technology, it's promising somehow promising but it's not can solve everything at all so first of all i want to explain what is digital health telehealth telemedicine e-health and m health because a lot of time we heard a lot about these terms but actually what are they so first of all for the digital health is a big umbrella of these wordings so digital health is the use of variable and implement technology web and email or mobile technology as well as other social network data management and analytics to improve health and also it complies with different sections of telemedicine and telehealth and you can see that telehealth and telemedicine or telecare actually under this umbrella. So what are they dif what are these term difference? The key difference are the telehealth actually does not always involve cl clinical services, but that one is the technology to deliver clinical services. And under these two terms, we have e-health and m-health. So e-health is talking about to use the computer to deliver healthcare services, which m-health is specifically to look at the mobile device, just like your mobile phone, your tablet, that sort of things. So today we will focus on telehealth, which is colors right here. And there are some examples for telehealth. First of all is um, for asthma. There is some apps for asthma to look after, uh, for patients to look after by, by themselves. And that app is called the My Asthma app, which is developed by one of the company called My M Health. And there are other apps to look at other conditions as well. And another common thing is a monitoring system. So this is one of the examples for monitoring system, which is developed by another team in our University of Edinburgh. So it's called Scale BP. So people will um, have their monitoring at their home and then they will enter their BP fellow by SMS to the, um, in their phone and then to the main system and then the practices will receive these kinds of information and then have a summary of the report to look at with the patients in their daily co in their regular consultation. And what I want to talk about is there are other things out there for telehealth. For example, for the robot in Japan, they use it for the elderly and then they also have other robots to help the nurse to move other patients to in other places. So it means that what I mean is telehealth has a lot of applications. It's not only for apps or not only for the uh, monitoring system, but there are different things as well. So what I want to show you next is a video about this QT robot. But sometimes I feel like people like to see video rather than just listen to my talk. So this is the video that I want to show you. Paraseal is a therapeutic robot that is used to engage people living with dementia. The benefits of the Paraseal are that it engages the person living with dementia and it gives them the opportunity to give and receive unconditional love and in so doing increases their sense of well-being which is essential for person-centred care. Well, some days that Lee has um, a bad day, um, she will isolate herself in her own room. She won't come out and interact with other residents because she gets a bit agitated. When Lee becomes agitated, we will bring out Paro, um, our interactive seal, and she will sit there and quietly pat him and interact with him, talk with him, um, and it seems to just calm her down. There's lots of reasons why Paro works. First, it's his cuteness. That, that's the first visual contact they have. Then the touch is so important and that he responds to their touch. So it's, it's all these fear, nurturing feelings that come out in the residents. And then of course stroking him, they settle. We have minimal behaviours there. 
If a behaviour has escalated, Paro can come in and de-escalate that behaviour and it continues on. It's not just while he's there, it, it has a flow-on effect. We do have a pet therapy program, however Paro fits that bill and more. One of the reasons is because with a pet, their emotions do come into play or a resident may have had a nasty experience with, with an animal, where Paro is non-confrontational, no preconceived ideas, and he's there responding for as long as they want. Paro has been used by a number of facilities with people in various stages of dementia, and the results have been fantastic. And we're really pleased that people are really engaging with Paro and enjoying and getting greater benefit from their life. So basically this is an example from the Australia, um, one of the research institutions. They use this robot to help elderly in their daily life. And I can hear some of the people actually talking when, when there is some uh, when the video is playing. So it means that you are, have some ideas about this video, which we can talk about later on after this presentation. So basically, what I want to show you in the video is there are some application for the robot. We can think about what kind of things that we can do with robot in the future. Because in the future, there will have a lot of robot. But the thing is, how do we use it in the right way? And how do we use it in the healthcare way? We have to think about it. And for telehealth development, we have to include a lot of people in the development, not only for connections, engineer, or other people. We have to include for the research people as well. But usually, different people have different thinking, have different <laughs> perspective. For the, res for the clinical researcher, we are always, always thinking about the clinical effectiveness of the interventions, the clinical effectiveness of the telehealth. And for the commercial party, the technology, co the technology companies, they are always thinking about the user engagement. They are thinking about how to engage patients in their system, whether people will download the apps, whether people will keep using the app. This is the things that they are concerned about always. And the reality is, I think most of people in this room we will have this feeling is a lot of healthcare professionals are very, very busy in their daily work. And then sometimes they will say that they just um, like overwork, overwork low, and a lot of things that have to deal with in different consultations. And then for patients, they're just not sure whether the telehealth is good for them. Is it safe? Is it good? Because there are so many products has already in the market. So how can I choose this telehealth? So the thing is, in the future, can we put, the question is, can we put this kind of people, different parties together to come up with a good solutions which can reduce the practice workload as well as make the patients happy and then let them know what kind of telehealth that they can choose from in the future. So in the following slides, I want to tell you about the telehealth from different perspectives to see how they are promising, but it's not, the problem, but it's not the solution for everything. So first of all, let's look at the clinical effectiveness of the telehealth. So this is the systematic review that we conduct. Actually, it's I, we conduct in the PhD study. So this systematic re review tells us that um, the telehealth for asthma is actually um, no advice effect, effect, and then there's no significant evidence on any in individual features, which is more important from others. And the interventions reports that either is no effect or positive effect. And then the new review, um, no review is actually report any adverse <coughs> effects, suggesting that the telehealth is a safe option for delivering self self management support. And then from another study, it's a review from another review. So the person has actually, the team has suggested, uh, has suggested a similar result for other conditions like diabetes, um, heart failure, as well as cancers. So it means that it's not only for asthma, but for other conditions, the telehealth is like in the borderline of like either no effect or positive effect. And from the BDS side guy that Harry has keep mentioned about, 
it suggests that the telehealth care may be considered as an option for supporting self-management. This is a conclusion that they made after reviewing the evidence in the past. And this is the BDSI guidelines for the asthma guide uh, for, for the asthma management as well as the diagnosis. So I just want to take this um, as a sample, asthma as an example to explain how telehealth can actually help in the clinical part for asthma. So I think most of you have very familiar with this BTS, BTSI guideline, maybe more familiar than me. So in this guideline has mentioned that there are different stages for people. There are pre-diagnosis stage, suspend um, asthma stage, as well as self-management stage. And the people are actually, if they doubt that whether they have asthma or not, they, they are actually entering in this stage. And then they will talk with um, the connections, and then the connections will think about, we observe them, and then we we'll initiate some um, medications for them, and then to observe them again, and to see if they are actually have the asthma with some tests. And then after the tests, then they will, if the patient has diagnosed have asthma, then they will bring them into a self measurement process, the self measurement stages. So it's a, it's a long way apart from the pediatric stage to self measurement stage. And when you think about how technology can help for asthma self measurement, because we're always talking about asthma self measurement. So particularly, how can technology help for um, asthma self measurement? We have used Prismon Testonomy to explain this kind of the application features or the, or the supporting features that the telehealth can actually help. So this 14 testonomy is actually summarized from um, around 100 hour CT interventions to support uh, long term conditions. And what they are actually talking about is not only for asthma, but other conditions as well. But as you can see that for this 14 testonomy, it has, it gives you a very precise and actual descriptions about the supporting things that technology can actually may be potentially help to, to deal with. And then first of all, you can see that, for example, the information about resources, it means that we can deliver some of the asthma education or the resources to educate people. And then for the social support, we can have some social support, maybe it's a social medium or discussion forum to help people to learn about the asthma. For action plan, of course, it's the core of the self-management. It could be implemented into a mobile phone for people to keep on in their like bed or when they are having the holiday or in their daily life, they can just check their phone for the action plan rather than just a paper base. Because currently we use paper base and then people will just lose the paper very easily for the action plan. But in the future, we use telehealth for, um, for the action plan. So the question is how may the technology contribute for asthma? And I would say from three different perspectives, which is quite general um, technologies nowadays that you have already seen. One is for the IoT, another one is artificial intelligence, and the third one is the big data. These are the three sections in technology which a lot of people ha has actually talked about, very, like, very engagingly, actively talk about. And then what I can see is the technology can actually to find the potentials to support this 14 testonomy in the self-measurement, as well as to support patients from pre-diagnosis stage to self-measurement stage. So let's talk about IoT first. IoT, you have talked, maybe you have uh, already hear about IoT a lot of time. So what is IoT actually? IoT is actually divided as a network of items each embedded with sensors and connect with internet to perform tasks. So it means that this is the best graphic that I can find online to explain the IoT, I think. So when you talk about IoT, IoT is not just a device that you can see to connect with internet. As opposed to this individual um, device, it's talking about a, 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 a big network to connect with different things all together. So for example, you will have the device, the electronic device, just like this um, wearable technology, smart gadget, and also your mobile phone, tablet, is on that side for your devices. And in, in the opposite side, you will have the um, home automation. So it means that you can have some kind of internet of things or devices connect into your home. So it's a smart home applications. So another thing is, 
the, the smart home application can also connect with the smart city. So in the city, you can have different sensors to implement into the building um, envelope or outside different area, for example, to collect environmental factor, the pollen count factor to fit into your system to predict the pollen level. And then the application is not only for healthcare, but also for other transportation, industrial or other environmental application as well. So it's a very big picture about IoT. So when you're talking about IoT, just remind yourself that it is not only the device that on your hand about to connect with the internet, but it's an entire big system behind that. And for asthma particularly, what can we do? We can have some smart gadgets just like smart p flow meter, smart inhaler to connect with this network to help for diagnosis and self-management. So for example, we can like use the smart p flow meter to capture some of the p flow value and then fill it back to the connections to help for diagnosis process because people are actually very keen on locking data by themselves. But with the smart gadget, the data can, can automatically connect it to the system and then the system can help the connections to make some dis, uh, decision support system to make some decisions about whether it is an asthma or not. And the things that within the self-management journey, you remember the 14 testonomy, the data, the peak flow meter data, as well as the smart inhaler data, it can help people to look after the asthma, review the asthma by themselves, learn how to use the smart inhaler by themselves as well. So this is the application and the other applications that patients has told us that they want to have their um, asthma conditions map on their activity. So it means that some of the patients um, really, really like to do some activities in their daily life and they want to have some integrations between their, they want to know how the exercise can actually affect their asthma. So it means that the smart inhaler with the number of puffs that they use after exercise or before exercise can help them to know more about what kind of exercise is the best for them to do in daily life. So this is one of the example that patients has already like told us that we, we want to have this kind of applications in, in, in the smart gauge or the smart technology that can help them. And then another technology, oh, is like, evidence first. So the evidence for the smart inhaler is, because we always talk about smart inhalers, so what you can see is the evidence for the clinical evidence for smart inhalers is it can actually help to improve the adherence to use smart inhaler, but it's not the solution for the asthma control. So it means that some kind is promising in, the, in terms of adherence, but it is not quite promising for the asthma control. So you can see that it is not everything. Technology is not everything. You have smart inhaler, but it doesn't mean that it directly um, can help you to uh, like make a better asthma outcome. And the other technology that I want to talk about is the big data. The big data is talking about you have actually got an extremely large data set, which you want to analyze to review some patterns, trends, or associations that especially that we can relate it to the human behavior interactions and then make some good um, like predictions afterward. So in this system is normally a lot of people have a lot of data and then you use IoT system to collect this kind of data in your daily life. And then this kind of like last set of data will go into the database. And then inside the database, there are a lot of data, one to EZ or N of the series of data. And inside those data, you can, you can use this data to construct a numerical model to help you for your predictions for different applications. But of course, you have to remember that what can, you have to think about what kind of model is the best to fit in for this data to give the, pro, uh, to give the predictions afterward. And the analysis predictions for different can be used for different purposes. For example, it can help you for the city planning for asthma patients or other patients as well. So this is one of the example for the use of big data. A research center in the US, they have used the Twitter as well as the environmental data to predict the risk of the daily ED um, visit 
in their in their area and also in their sector and then they find that it's quite useful because they can see that a lot of people are actually using Twitter to talk about the tweet about asthma and then talk about asthma so that's why they're trying to extract those data and then with this kind of keywords the running nose sneezing wheezing inhaler as well as asthma they use this kind of specific words to extract the information and then put this information onto different areas and then they also put the information about the environmental factors onto this uh, in, into the map as well and then what you can see here is the result to see what kind of things that people are actually do, uh, talking about in different areas and then from this model of course they have do a lot of calculations they have a prediction model for this um, ED visit and then the prediction uh, positions is approximately 70% of course, this is not 100%. It's, it's really, really hard to have 100% and it, almost nothing can actually reach to run 100%. So 70%, fairly okay, not too bad, but you can just take it as an advice or reference for the uh, prediction model. So this is one of the applications and this is a technology to support the whole asthma journey. It's not only for self-management or not only for diagnosis, but it's for the whole management journey. Artificial intelligence, which is a, another very hot topic as well. So artificial intelligence is the area to talk about the computer science that make it possible for machine to learn about new ex experience and adjust output and perform human-like tasks. And first of all, we have to understand that there are different kinds of artificial intelligence when we are talking about AI. It's not just one AI, there are three different, generally this is a three different kind of AI. The first level of AI is called the weak AI or the narrow AI. It means that the AI can only perform for a specific task. <laughs> and then if you, take out about, if you take out this specific task, the machine cannot do anything. So this is the weak AI. And another step which is higher than the weak, uh, weak AI is the AGI, is the um, artificial general intelligence. So it means that the machines can actually have the ability to mimic human intelligence or behavior into a way that people cannot distinguish whether it is a machine or not. So this is the middle way uh, in the um, in, middle level of AI and the highest um, architecture of the AI is the artificial super intelligence which means that the machines can actually suppress the human behavior so it's clever than human and then brilliant than human in some sense so nowadays where we are we're actually in the first two the weak, AI, the weak AI as well as the AGI. So when you see some technology that some telehealth, which they call it to use AI to have some prediction model or have some performance at the backbone. So definitely, most likely they actually belongs to the weak AI or the AGI. Cause the super intelligent is not yet actually at the moment that you can see in the market because it's so intelligent, which unless someone sitting um, aside you is actually an AI that you cannot distinguish. Otherwise, this is not happening currently at the moment because it's, it's talking about really, really intelligent things which um, can actually, human cannot identify and it's more clever than human, can teach you in front of like everyone. So can be a teacher, can be examiner uh, or mathematics, uh, that kind of things. They can create something by themselves. So you can see that in the past um, for the um, smart inhaler tally, this is one of the example in some of the research looking this um, to uh, to use the inhaler tally. And then this group was actually using a mobile phone to capture people's behavior, capture people's using this um, the inhaler to see if the inhaler tally is good or not. They didn't <coughs> apply any artificial intelligence yet but maybe in the future they will apply for it. And another example is some of the device for the inhaler, they have already got a checking about the inhaler tally by using their like, um, by using the, the signal that they detect from the core thing, that sort of things and taking the inhaler. But of course there's no AI inside there as well. So in the future, can we use artificial intelligence directly to detect the inhaler tally or use a robot the higher level robot, the super intelligent robot to help you to monitor the patient's positions, whether they are doing right or wrong at home. 
it is a question. So another perspective for, uh, about telehealth is how to engage in patients and how to engage in people to use their telehealth. So the thing is, if the people don't use telehealth, although they are promising, it is useless. So using a, um, what I want to do is to use a behavior change model to look at this kind of problem. So this is a BJ form behavior change model. What they mentioned is about there are three key factors for people to change their behavior from not adoptions to an adoption and whether they are use this technology and whether they will keep using this technology. So it's a behavior change. So they have identified three key factors for those behavior change. The first factor is the motivations. The second factor is the triggers and the third factor uh, third factor is the ability. So what this graph is showing is if the task is very hard to do, then it means that you need to have a very high motivation to ask people to change their behavior. And of course, the trigger should be up here in the right time. It means that people will add right here. So if the task is very easy to do, you just need a very low motivation to ask people to do some actions right here. So this is basically the concept is to map people's behavior onto this model. And then people's behavior will just struggling within this line. And for this side is the people who will uh, successfully trigger a new actions. And then for this side is the people which is unsuccessfully trigger the action. And for one of the studies, the A4A study, we asked people to adopt a new prototype app to support their asthma self measurement. And then we carry out the the um, questionnaire and interview before and after the study. We asked three, uh, we used three different methods to ask people to adopt this new technology. The first one is we asked um, the GP to help us to deliver the in uh, invitations letter to the patient to invite them to use our app. And the second stream, stream B, we ask asthma nurse to help us to invite patients during their consultation. And the last stream is we use the social medium, the asthma UK or the asthma UK, AUK car social medium to ask people to download our app. So the result is we can see that a lot of people are actually come from stream C. It means that a lot of people are actually coming from the social medium. <coughs> And for the adoption, we can see that the easy of access to download is the key for the adoption of all the new technology for our app. And also the process needs to, ass but the process has to uh, ass assist with the sufficient motivations. So probably should be prioritized in the form of the GP or asthma nurse invitation. So again, you can see that the telehealth somehow can engage people, but without the GP and asthma nurse, we cannot do much things in the motivations to motivate them, to, to have a high motivation, motivate them to adopt the technology. And for the adherents, you can see that the GP and asthma nurse encouragement is the key to ask people to keep <laughs> using the technology and keep using the app. So again, you can see that technology is not everything. We need to have someone, especially for the professional behind, to help people to keep using this kind of technology. <laughs> and then the last bit is a take home message. Telehealth is promise, but it's, it's not a solution for everything. There are different components that we have to consider when we use or choose a telehealth. <laughs> we have to think about what kind of features that we want to use in the telehealth, whether it's just purely monitoring or other features as well, just like the self-management, the 14 self-management features or the diagnosis features. And then what people actually want from their telehealth system, so from another research, we have already knew that the patients want to have some telehealth which is fit into their routine life. So it's not something very new for them, <laughs> but it's something that can fit into their daily habit or daily things. So this is the key. And the other thing is the telehealth should be easy to use. It's not difficult to use. Sometimes we have to give some technical support for people to adopt the technology. And then for the practice enga engagement in the system is very important. But the thing is we have to think about a lot of 
GP and S manuals are already very, very busy. So it means that every new system should be fit into their routine practice as well. We are not going to use a telehealth to add on on their current work and to make more work to them. It is not the case. We just want to help them to see if there are any features can improve their like routine consultations or any features that can trade off their time for other things. And other considerations are very technical things. Of course, the system have to be stable, have to be like interoperable. It means that they can talk with different devices. Patients can choose the device that they want to connect with the system to perform the tasks. And then also the security things, data privacy, also the system cost. We, 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 we cannot afford for a very high cost of the system for telehealth. So the last message is the telehealth need different people to work together, not just one part of the people, not just engineer or just GP or as nurse. We need different people to play together, just like to, to do a triangle dance. We need to have the same beat, we need to have same face, but not crashing each other, work together to play a good game. So I think basically this is what I want to say today. So if you have any question, you can just ask me during the tea break, I think, because I'm running out of time, I realise that. Yeah? A couple of minutes. Yeah. Thanks ever so much, Aya. Thank you. Wait a I told you it would be a bit futuristic. Um, it makes me feel very old or a Luddite or something um, when I hear about these things. But these things are just being talked about all the time. And I thought it might be just interesting to sit, for you to hear how people are beginning to think. Any feedback for IO? Or is this just so horrific that you can't imagine it? <laughs> <laughs> or are you thinking this is wonderful? It's going to be the future. It's going to be the future. You have a convert, convert here. Do you want to comment? I probably think more and more uh, younger generation are switched on with technology, so probably they'll the uptake is going to be, you know, high, I think, the coming generation. You think the uptake will be higher than I would think? I would think so. I mean, I didn't know what IoT stood for. <laughs> is there anybody else in the audience who do? Sorry, yeah, no, thanks for that talk. Um, the only, I just had a question about uh, user engagement, yes. where when you've looked at all your research trials, in any of the kind of telemedicine projects I've been involved in or anything we're doing, we're always looking, um, maybe, perhaps in Tayside, side, about the bottom line of health inequality. And we're kind of a pediatric group and we're looking at how whenever we bring in interventions, some of these interventions are very expensive, they tend to work when you've got two uh, healthcare interfaces like secondary care and primary care, we've been successful there. But whenever we're engaging in more expensive products with telecare, where we're trying to improve things for a lot of our patients, then the depth quintile becomes really important that we're actually making things better in a healthcare system where it's already unequal. And the worries we've had with previous projects like this is it makes it better for a group that are already motivated, that are already getting a good deal, and then you're spending money on a group, you know, it makes you feel better as a clinician, but I don't know what you're doing for the service. Did any of that data, when you're looking at user engagement and your behavior model, did any of that look, plot that to their depth cat quintile and the lowest deprivation schools? In that sense is, so your question is whether the Telehealth can actually help you to improve the patient's engagement in, health, in, in particularly when it comes to health. It's a question of the deprivation issue, isn't it? Mm. And of course, that, that is always a problem because, I mean, Ayo got a lovely response to her tweets, but what we don't really know is whether, in fact, we were, as you say, simply widening the gap. Yeah, I think it's just in terms of the long term or short term. For the short term one, the social medium is good because you have a prompt actions for a specific group of people. And that specific group of people are actually like the younger people. But for the nurse and like the GP invitation, it is a long run things. And then people are actually, you can see that people are actually adherent more if you are like recruited by GP or as a nurse. And that group of people are actually the people like more higher, like elderly people and more experienced in asthma people. So. It, that's the, like, the kind of characteristics behind that. Thing. I think the other thing is, to my mind, as I say, I speak as somebody who finds this all quite extraordinary. Um, but in fact, if this is coming, it will get cheaper. And whilst I suspect it will increase 
the inequities in the short term, if it's actually working and is shown to work, then I suspect it will become something. I mean, you know, like smartphones, nearly everybody's got a smartphone now and give it another 10 years, I suspect everybody will have a smartphone. So I think it's probably a short term increase in inequity. But if we can show it really works, then it may in fact improve. I think the biggest inequity is that my house in Canterbury, five miles out of Canterbury, can't get a decent mobile signal or a broadband. So I think there are some major inequities, which in the middle of Dundee you don't have, where your broadband is just extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so I think there are lots of inequities, but it's a valid point, isn't it? Another comment from the back, just quickly, because we've got run out of time. Really Good comment. I've done research in IT, and I could be interesting to compare with internet banking, where there were similar uh, thoughts ten years ago that uh, people who didn't have access to internet would be disadvantaged. But I think now, when the penetration is so high, it drives down the cost, and I don't think anyone now is thinking about going back to not have internet banking. And I think it is a matter of whether we can like, work with the commercial party or not. Yes. If we can work with commercial party very effectively, then we can have a win-win situation. We can have a cheaper cost about the telehealth, as well as the commercial party would be very happy to deliver this kind of telehealth in the future, because they will get a group of like standard, um, steady customers in the future.